Good morning, everyone. Great to see you at church. I'm Jim. I'm one of the pastors. It's my privilege to be able to speak this morning. Um, If you're listening on iTunes, watching on YouTube, hope this message really encourages you guys as well. Um, Just fantastic to see that video. Let me just say thank you. Um, Last Sunday, we showed a video um, from Edward Berea in Kenya, um, showing that the difference um, that you're giving made to many, many people in Kenya through drought uh, and um, through aid. We were able to give um, thousands of pounds last year to that. And then to see this video, see the giving again that you guys have given, the difference that it's made to the house, what we're able to do together. So can I just say a massive thank you for your amazing generosity? Just incredible to be able to report back on these things. Um, I'd also, before I just kind of get going, would love to ask for your prayers. Um, tomorrow I'm flying to Brazil um, with a small team of other pastors that I'm leading to work with a number of churches that we're developing links with out there. And it's very exciting, um, but this is a really important trip in terms of kind of laying some key foundations in those relationships and working with those pastors and churches. So I I fly out tomorrow, I come back the following Tuesday or Wednesday, I think it is. It's going to be a busy schedule, so I'd love your prayers. So that would be great. Last year, I went to Brazil. It was 42 degrees and very humid, and I liked the sun, but man, that was hot. And I kind of didn't really think it through in my packing, so I mainly packed um, denim skinny jeans, which was like a big mistake when you're preaching endlessly in unair-conditioned churches in Brazil. So I thought I'd, I'd be prepared this time. I went online, so I'm going to buy myself some shorts. And um, I I just, I'm not a big shopper, I don't really enjoy it, so I just click on the cheapest thing that I can find, the thing that will do. And then the shorts arrived, and they were slightly different colour than I was imagining, and I need your help to know if I can get away with this, all right? So, so these are the shorts. Um, So if you say yes, can I hear a big yay? Any no's? The eyes have it. The eyes have it. Excellent stuff. There we go. So I'll send you the photos. Excellent. Um, So we are going to be continuing our Meeting Jesus series this morning. Um, If you have a Bible, turn again. Let's go again to Luke's Gospel. We're going to be Luke chapter 7 today. Um, We've been looking the last few weeks at this Um, account of Jesus' life. There's four accounts of Jesus' life in the Bible, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're looking at people that met Jesus in incredible ways. And um, we're going to be looking at a story in Luke chapter 7 about a soldier. A soldier who had incredible faith in Jesus. You may want to turn there on your phones or gadgets or um, one of these things. They're they're called books, um, a Bible. And we're going to read from there in a moment. You know, in the Bible, there are just two occasions where we read that Jesus was amazed by something that people did. Uh, Most of the time when we're reading through the Gospels, we read about ordinary men and women like you and me being amazed at what Jesus did or what Jesus said or how Jesus reacted in the situation. There are just two situations, only two, in the Gospels where we read that Jesus was amazed at what someone else did. And one of those occasions is in the book of Mark. So it's another one of these accounts of Jesus' life. In Mark chapter 6, we read that Jesus goes back to his hometown, Nazareth, and he's teaching there. But people are like really skeptical about him. People are like questioning his authority to say the things that he's saying. There's real skepticism. And it says that Jesus was unable to do many miracles in that place. Uh, Similar today, lots of people are very skeptical about Jesus. And that was going on for Jesus. And in Mark 6, verse 6, we read that he was amazed at their lack of faith. There's one of the occasions when we read that Jesus was amazed. He was amazed, astonished, surprised. He marveled at their lack of faith. And then in this story today, in Luke chapter 7, we're reading about this soldier. And in Luke 7, verse 9, we read this. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. See the word again there, amazed. He he marveled. He, He was astonished. Jesus was surprised at the soldier in this story we're about to read, this time because of his great faith. So only two times in the Gospels, Jesus is amazed. 
Once he is amazed at people's lack of faith in him. And the other time he is amazed at someone's great faith in him. And as we read this story in Luke today, Luke is wanting to provoke us about our faith in Jesus. About who we really believe him to be. I mean, really. The degree to which we trust his words, the degree to which we are building our lives upon this Jesus that we've been singing about this morning. Um, Faith, the Bible describes in this way in the book of Hebrews, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This soldier had great confidence and assurance in who Jesus said he was. And Jesus was amazed by that. So let's, let's read the whole story. I'm going to read from verses 1 through 10 of Luke 7. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, there's a big block of teaching in Luke 6, if you want to look back at that. He entered Capernaum, and there a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself. For I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes. And that one come and he comes. I I say to my servant do this and he does it. And when Jesus heard this he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I've not found such great faith, even in Israel. And then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. So Jesus enters Capernaum. We read about Capernaum quite a lot in the Gospels. Um, It's a small town. Jesus spent quite a lot of his time there. And there's this centurion, this soldier, whose servant is really sick, and the centurion has heard of Jesus. Um, He's heard about him, and so he asks Jesus if he can help. Let's spend some time thinking about who this centurion is. What does the passage tell us about him? Well, centurions were were soldiers that had quite a lot of authority. Um, They would be placed in command of a hundred men. That's why they're called centurions from the word um, century. That's where the same root word comes from. Um, He wouldn't have been a Jewish guy. Um, uh, There's some debate as to whether he was Roman or not, but he would have been a Gentile, which means non-Jewish. So he would have commanded an occupying force, um, maybe even Herod's army, if you know that name, his Bible name. Um, and a centurion would have authority for a hundred um, soldiers, and he's stationed in this town of Capernaum. And centurions were held in high respect. There is a Greek historian called Polybius who lived just before Jesus, a little while before him, and he wrote about centurions that they must be not so much seekers after danger as men who can command steady in action and reliable. They ought not to be over-anxious to rush into the fight, but when hard-pressed, they must be ready to hold their ground and die at their posts. So centurions were, were men who were able to command. They were steady. They were reliable. They were to hold their ground, and they would be willing to die where they were stationed if needs be. But they were a key position in any army at that time. And so we have this centurion, and we read that this centurion was a kind man. He was compassionate. How do we know that? Well, we know that because he was deeply concerned about the health of one of his servants. Um, That was quite unusual, actually, for the day. Um, It was not unusual for people to have servants and slaves. And actually, in that culture, servants and slaves were not treated particularly well at all. So to find a slave master or a servant master who would be concerned about the health of a servant or a slave would have been quite unusual. In Roman law, a slave was defined as well, like a living tool, an implement. If they had no rights, 
A master could ill treat them. And normally when a servant was past their ability to work, they would just be discarded and another one would be found. And so here we have this Gentile soldier of some authority who's actually got a kindness and a compassion and a care for a servant that is under his care. And he clearly had concern about what was happening in his health. And so he sends for Jesus. Maybe he's heard stories about what Jesus has been saying. Maybe he's heard some of the incredible stories of the miracles that we've already looked at over the last few weeks together. But he believes Jesus is going to be able to help. And so he sends some people to Jesus. It's interesting, he's not Jewish, and culturally it may have been quite odd for him to approach a Jewish rabbi. So look at the detail we read in verse 3. It says that the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servants. This guy has authority in the army. He's kind to his servants. But we also see here, he's got quite a lot of authority and influence in the local community. The Jewish elders were like the statesmen of that community. They were the spiritual leaders, but not just the spiritual leaders. People would have gone to them for wisdom and counsel and advice. And here is this soldier who is able to call upon the elder statesmen of the community and say, can you run a message for me? That's basically what's going on here. Can you go to Jesus on my behalf? Can you go? And so he sends the Jewish elders to him, and they didn't object to that request. In fact, they did exactly as he asked them to. It's an interesting kind of detail, because Jewish elders weren't messenger boys. But there's some influence that this guy had, some good relationship with the Jewish community, that he was able to send the Jewish elders, and they did exactly what the centurion asked them to do. He clearly had a good relationship with those that he ruled. He had respect in the community. So he was a military leader with quite a lot of clout in the army. He was a kind and compassionate man. He had influence in the local community because he was able to call upon the Jewish elders to go on his behalf. And we also discover something else about him. He was generous. He was a generous man. He contributed to the local community. This, again, was unusual. Um, Most Gentiles hated Jews and vice versa. But here was someone stationed in the army who had contributed and invested in the local community. How do we know that? Well, look at what the Jewish elders say in verse 4. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. Jesus, you must help this guy. I mean, he, he's, he's for us. I mean, he's on our side. He, he loves us. And also, he came up with the cash for the synagogue. Um, the synagogue was like the local church building of the day. It's like, Jesus, um, please kind of keep him on board. He deserves it. He's a good man. He's held in high respect. He, he helped fund the synagogue here. We, we owe him, Jesus. He deserves your attention and your time. Um, this is a pic of the synagogue in Capernaum. And still visit it today. Um, what you see here actually is, is the white stones of a synagogue that was built in the 4th century. But apparently if you go there, you'll see very, very clearly that this building is built on the foundations of another building with darker stones. And that foundation is the synagogue that this guy funded to build. Um, you can go there today, you can see it in Capernaum. Don't you love the Bible's archaeology? They love the fact that this is living and breathing. We're, we're reading a story here that this Dr. Luke wrote 2,000 years ago about a, a Gentile soldier that built a synagogue, and you can still go there and see the foundations of that synagogue in place. It's not myth and legend. We're talking about some history here. And this guy has standing in the community, and he's been the primary donor of the local church building fund. And the Jewish elders are like Jesus. You need to go to this guy, seriously. Uh, I know he's not Jewish, but listen, he deserves your attention. He's been nine, nice to us, and, and um, we want to keep him on side for when we car park, you know, time at the car park, because if we can keep him on side, then maybe you can help with that part of the project as well. Could you help us out here, Jesus? He deserves it. He deserves it. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Jesus, he deserves it. 
I wonder if sometimes we pray like that into situations. Uh, Jesus, I know I'm not perfect. Uh, I know I've made a few mistakes, but I've got this request for you, which I think I kind of deserve to have answered, actually. I don't ask for much, God. And I did go to church this week, and I put some money in the offering, and I even went to life group. I think I deserve this one request, God. I think he deserves it. Interesting thing, because church, no one deserves anything from Jesus. None of us, this soldier, no one deserves anything from Jesus. These Jewish elders are like, he, he deserves it. We cannot bribe God into answering our prayers because of how good we think we are or what we may have done. We don't approach God asking things by saying, God, I think I deserve to be given this. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve anything. <laughs> Grace is not earned or deserved. It is the gift of God. We've just been singing that. We don't deserve anything. This guy didn't deserve anything just because he was a high person of authority with good moral standing and generosity it doesn't deserve anything everything we have from God is because of his goodness and his kindness and his grace it's not about our effort so interesting last week Steve was speaking about a tax collector if you were here you'd have heard that and I'm the tax collector Jewish people really didn't like and when Jesus chose the tax collector everyone was astonished like Jesus how dare you he doesn't deserve your attention Uh, do you know who he is do you know what he's done he doesn't deserve your attention here we've got someone that the Jewish guy says he really does deserve your attention he's morally upright and generous and good standing in the community people making judgments on externals people making judgments on good works isn't it interesting how people make judgments on who they think is and isn't deserving of Jesus's attention but here's the thing I reckon we do that all the time I reckon there are prejudices and subconscious thoughts that we have of who we think is worthy or not worthy who does deserve or who doesn't deserve things or doesn't deserve Jesus's attention or does deserve Jesus's attention tax collectors no Generous, upstanding men in the community, yes. We make judgment calls all the time. Isn't it interesting who we think is deserving of Jesus' attention? Do you know what? I think we are going to be seriously shocked when we get to heaven about who is and who is not there. It's not based on who deserves what. It's based on his grace. Hallelujah. It's not about our efforts. It's his choice, his invitation, not our works, whether they be good or bad. It's not based upon our relational status. His favor is not based upon our bank balance or our postcard. It's based upon his kindness and his goodness and his grace. Hallelujah for the grace of God. Twin dangers that we can fall into. Two dangers that we can fall into with this stuff. The first is we can feel like we're like the tax collectors. We count ourselves out of following Jesus. I don't know if I can be a Christian. I don't know if I'm good enough. How can I possibly follow him? How can I possibly be a Christian? If only people knew me, if only people knew how bad I was. Hey, listen, no one's deserving of the grace of God. That's the glorious thing of it. No one is. It's a free gift for all who are called on the name of Jesus. And the second danger is we think we do deserve God's kindness. Uh, I've lived a good life. I've not um, deliberately upset anyone. I've been generous. And we think, yeah, God owes me something. No, no, God doesn't owe us anything. It's all his grace. It's not about our efforts, whether they or we think they are good or bad. We're all saved by his grace. Hallelujah. So the Jewish leaders say, Jesus, this guy, he deserves some attention. And Jesus, in his kindness, says, okay, let's go along. Let's go and meet the centurion and starts a journey there. And on his way, as they're traveling, another group of people are sent by the centurion. Verse 6, he was not far from the house. Centurion sent friends to him. And we see another aspect of this centurion's life. We've seen that he has authority. We've seen that he's kind. He's got good standing in the community and he's generous. Now we see something of his humility. Look look at verse 6. Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why 
and I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. The Jewish leader said, Jesus, you better come. He deserves it. This guy says, I don't deserve anything. I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. I'm not even worthy for me to come to you. I mean, it would have been culturally shocking for a Jewish rabbi to enter a house with a Gentile. So he's culturally sensitive. But something else is going on here. This guy understands who Jesus is. And he understands who he is. And he's like, wow, Jesus, I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve for you to come to my house, Jesus. Incredible humility, actually. He has power, he has authority, he has wealth, and yet before Jesus, he knows none of that means anything. I'm not worthy to come to him. Doesn't matter what my CV says. It makes no difference, actually, if you grew up in a Christian home or if you've never been to church, or it makes no difference if you have wealth or and, and can give money generously, or if you're on the breadline and struggle financially, it makes no difference whether you have a high-flying job or whether you're unemployed. It makes no difference if you're kind of degree-level educated or if you left school at 15. Before Jesus, we are all the same. It's like this wonderful flat line. We're all the same. We all come before Jesus in the same way. Jesus, we're not worthy. This guy, this soldier, he understood something about who Jesus is. He understood something about his divinity, that he is God. The Jewish leaders say, this guy deserves it. The centurion says, there's no way I deserve anything. He shows us it's possible to have authority and position and yet also live a humble life before Christ. And it's because he got who Jesus was. He understood that Jesus was the Son of God. He understood that this was not just another rabbi, not just another teacher, The tragic story of the Bible that we read through in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is that some people get who Jesus is and others miss the point altogether. And one of the most sad things is that the Bible tells us is Jesus' own people that miss it the most. John 1 tells us that he, Jesus, came to that which was his own, which is the Jewish people, but his own people did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So some people get him, others people miss him, and the people that miss him the most often were his own people. Yet to those who received him, those who understood who he was and believed in his name, they were welcomed into the household of God. Like the centurion here became children of God. It's the same promise for us today. Do you get who Jesus is? I mean, do you really understand who he is? He is the son of the living God. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the gate through which we must enter. He is the prince of peace. He is the king of kings. He is not just a spiritual guru. He is the only true begotten Son of God. Do you get, and I'm asking that question to people that would call themselves Christians today and non-Christians in the same thing. Do you really get who Jesus is? There's something about this centurion who he understood who Jesus was. Do you get that Jesus is not someone who owes you anything, but he's someone to whom we owe everything? Do we get that Jesus does not exist to make our life easier, but we exist to bring him glory? Now, when I was 17, I had kind of one of these moments, you know, you keep learning in your faith all the time, you're growing and learning. But when I was 17, I had this kind of moment where I thought, if Jesus is who he said he was, like if he really is who the Bible presents him to be, then I've got to be all in with this. I can't be half-hearted with this. It's either real or it isn't. It's like what C.S. Lewis said. He said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Jesus is either who he said he was, and therefore it's of infinite importance, or he's not who he said he was, and therefore he's a liar and deserves no attention at all. The one thing Jesus cannot be is mildly important, like a little bit important. He's either of no importance or of infinite importance. And this guy understands Oh, Jesus, I'm not even worthy to come to you. He gets who Jesus is. Do you get who he is? I'm worthy to approach you, but look what he says at verse 7. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. 
Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant do this and he does it. Here's the key moment of the story. The centurion says look. I I get how authority works. I'm a military man. Somewhere in Caesarea, 50 miles away, he will have a commander. When the commander issued a command to him, he'd say, I have to do that. That's the way the military works. He was over 100 men. When he issued a command to the 100 men, they would do what he said because that was the chain of command that happened and existed in his context. He understands it. I tell one of my soldiers, go, he goes. And he says, but Jesus... You are are the one of ultimate authority. So just say the word and it will happen. You don't need to come. I I know your words carry power. Just say the words. He he had faith that Jesus' words carried power. It wasn't like an abstract belief in God. It was like, say it and I know it will happen because I can see Jesus. You're a man with authority. I get how authority works. This is what Jesus was amazed at. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turning to the crowd, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. The end of the story tells us the servant is healed. But that's not the point of this story, actually. The point of this story is the centurion's response to Jesus. The faith that he demonstrates in the words that Jesus speak is this declaration of trust and belief that Jesus is who he said he was. And Jesus isn't amazed by the centurion's authority and successful career in the military. He's not amazed at his compassion for his servant. He's not amazed um, at his good reputation with the Jewish elders. He's not amazed at his generous donation for the church building fund. He's not even amazed at his humility. What is Jesus amazed at? At his faith. You get it. You get it. All those other things for Jesus, they don't matter. What matters is this man understands who I am. Lord, I know you can do this. Just speak a word. Man, I want to have faith like that. Anyone here want to have faith like that centurion here? Show me a hand if you do, yeah. I want to to speak a word and think, yeah, wow, Jesus, you can say a word and that can happen. I mean, do we really believe what Jesus says? So when Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, When we look at the scene in the UK and everything is written about the decline of the church, do we give in to that or do we say, no, Jesus spoke a word. Jesus said he's going to build his church. I'm going to live my life in such a way that believes the promises of Jesus. So when Jesus says, where two or three are gathered, there I will also, how does that impact when we gather as a church community on a Sunday morning? Do we come full of expectancy saying, do you know what? Jesus said that where two or three are gathered, he was going to be. I'm going to take Jesus at his word. I'm going to believe he is there when I gather with my Christian brothers and sisters, because that's what he said. When Jesus said, surely I will be with you to the ends of the age, do we say, okay, well, I'm not sure I fear him at the moment or not. Or do we say, no, Jesus spoke a word, so I'm going to exercise my trust in the spoken word of Jesus. Putting our faith in who he is and what he says. Let me close by just saying one final thing about this story. Um, Those of you that have looked closely at this passage may have noticed one detail which is quite interesting. Um, The centurion actually never meets Jesus in the story, which is ironic, isn't it, for a a series called Meeting Jesus? I mean, who comes up with this stuff, really? Seriously, who comes up with these teaching outlines about people that meet Jesus and then the person doesn't actually meet Jesus? He sends people on two occasions sends the Jewish elders, first of all, and then he sends um, his friends the second occasion. He doesn't actually go. He never meets Jesus, but he still believes that Jesus is who he said he was. And Jesus still declares that he's amazed at this guy's faith. Isn't that even more remarkable? This guy didn't actually see Jesus, and yet still he believed he's able to do what he says didn't actually meet him face to face. Sometimes I think we can fall into the trap of thinking, well, if Jesus was here, if I could see him with my own eyes, yeah, I'd believe him then. If I could could see him turn water into wine, yep, I'm in. If I could see him feed the 5,000, I'm there. I'm going to be in. If I could see him raise the dead, I mean, it's easy for those in the Bible. They walked with Jesus, didn't they? I mean, they saw these things happen. They heard him teach these things. They saw him perform the miracles. Maybe that's part of your story. Maybe you're like, if I could see Jesus, I'd believe. 
But look at this guy. He doesn't actually meet Jesus, but still he has this amazing faith. He gets who he is. Right at the end of the Gospels in John, one of Jesus' closest followers was a bit sceptical too. Um, Jesus had risen again from the grave. And there's this guy called Thomas who hadn't seen him. And Thomas is like, I don't believe it. Unless I see him, unless I can put my hands in his hands where the wounds were, unless I see the wounds myself, I'm not going to believe in Jesus. And then there's this moment where Thomas meets Jesus and he falls to the floor and he says, my Lord and my God, I've seen. Wow. Do you know what Jesus said in that moment in John 20? Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We're putting our faith as Christians. We haven't seen Jesus face to face. One day we will see him, hallelujah. But we're putting our faith in what this reveals. We're putting our faith in what the Holy Spirit has done in our hearts. We're putting our faith. We haven't seen him. And yet the Bible says, Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Do you, do you believe that? You put your faith in Jesus? He said you're blessed because you put your faith in him, even though you didn't walk with him and didn't see the miracles. The centurion didn't see him, but he believed in him. What about you? Right now, right here, today, do you see who Jesus is? Do you see what the Bible tells us about him? Have you put your faith in him? Faith which is certain of what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. And I'll speak to you this morning whether you are a, a, um, currently not a follower of Jesus, not a Christian, and I speak to Christians in the room and say, are you fully putting your faith in Jesus? Trust in him with your life, not because you deserve it or don't deserve it, but because of his grace has made it possible for you to know him. He's not impressed by our social status or the number of social media followers we have or the number of people we line manage at work or by our position in community or generous donations or anything of that. What Jesus marvels at, what he's surprised at and astonished at and loves to see is faith. Men and women that say, yeah, I believe Jesus and I'm going to trust what he says. Do you believe him? Do you trust what he says? In a moment, we're going to worship, but I want us just to pray. And it may be that you just want to simply say again in your heart, maybe like almost like a recommitment, Lord, I believe you today. I'm going to trust Jesus. Maybe you've been a Christian many years and you found yourself trusting some other things more than you trust him. Maybe it's a moment today saying, no, no, I'm going to trust him. I believe who he says he is. Why don't we stand to our feet for a moment? Band, that would be great. Thank you.